Today we're going to be talking about four nutrient deficiencies that can plateau your recovery that can wreck your health. These are what, what I really wanted to focus on today were four of the most common vitamin mineral deficiencies that I see in my practice over the last 16 years that when these nutrients are absent or are too low, uh, it can really, really plateau a person's capacity and really, really wreck their ability to heal. So let's dive in to that topic. The first one I want to talk about is magnesium. So magnesium deficiency, I want you to understand, first of all, magnesium plays a role in more than 300 functions in the human body, just that we know of. There are probably many, many more that we've yet to discover, but it's a very, very crucial element. It's a mineral, and it's oftentimes, although not referred to as one, it is, it is an electrolyte, and it's a very, very important electrolyte. But magnesium has other functions as well. And as you can see on the diagram I put up for you uh, in this diagram, but a number of the different kind of concepts of what I'd like you magnesium and why it's so important. Number one, what causes magnesium deficiency? For most people, it's chronic stress. It's an overabundance of carbohydrate intake. Um, one of the things you want to understand about magnesium is it plays about eight critical different roles in your body's ability to break down carbohydrates to generate energy. So if you are a heavy carbohydrate consumer, and, and especially if it's refined carbohydrates, so like you guys should already at this point know my take on grain, but refined carbohydrates are that are um, highly processed generally don't have magnesium in them. And so in order for your body to properly break them down, your body needs that magnesium. So if you're eating high level of carbohydrates without magnesium, you're actually going to be taking from your own magnesium storage to try to process those carbohydrates and generate them into energy. And that as, a, as, as in and of itself, cause magnesium leaching. That's eating refined food is your own internal storage of magnesium leading to magnesium depletion. So refined carbohydrates high in the diet is one way we become magnesium deficient. One of the other ways is through high levels of stress. High levels of stress will kick on or turn on glucocorticoid production. In essence, it will turn on your adrenal glands and overproduce cortisol. Cortisol leaches magnesium as well. It's one of the, the hormones that the more of it you have, the more of it you have uh, on a consistent basis. So like those of you who are taking corticosteroids or uh, oral prednisone or other types of steroids for pain or for even for, and you've been seeing a doctor or they're using it for adrenal function or to help you with pain and inflammation and fatigue. Those things deplete the body of magnesium over time. So corticosteroids, again, another common reason. Stress. Remember, stress by itself can tell your adrenal glands to, to make more corticosteroids, but you can also be prescribed a corticosteroid, an oral steroid, and so either mechanism can cause a magnesium depletion. One of the other things that's common with magnesium or, or commonly seen with magnesium depletion is the chronic use of diuretics and beverages that have high levels of caffeine. So if you, you, know, you drink one cup of coffee a day, that's not so much what I'm talking about, but if you're drinking six cups of coffee a day, I just got Last week, I think we were drinking like eight cups a day. You know, they were getting about a thousand milligrams of caffeine plus per day. It's a huge magnesium and potassium depletion, but in this case, magnesium. The diuretics, magnesium. Now, some of the other types of diuretics you often have to to think about are the medicines high blood pressure. So, like diuretics used to lower blood pressure. Diuretics reduce the volume of water in the body, and that in and of itself will have an effect on blood pressure. But the problem with that is that it also causes the kidneys to not re uptake magnesium very effectively. So um, the diuretic, think about it like this, about 90 plus percent of your magnesium is reabsorbed by your tubule when you're filtering your blood. And if you're taking a diuretic, that it can actually be hindered and you're actually urinating out more magnesium than what you otherwise would. So that's one of the reasons why diuretics will cause a magnesium loss. Now, the problem with magnesium loss, so if any of those things apply to you, high carbohydrate diet, high stress lifestyle, or you've been put on blood pressure medications, or you're a chronic caffeine user, all of those areas are going to be areas where you can become magnesium depleted. And remember what I said, magnesium is responsible for 300, at least 300 biochemical reactions inside your body. Many of those reactions are related to generation of energy. Some of them are antioxidant functions. Magnesium is a natural muscle relaxer. You need magnesium to make 
dopamine and serotonin, magnesium for proper peristalsis, magnesium uh, in your muscles for proper strength and growth, you need magnesium in your bone. There's just a number of different functions that magnesium is critical for. So if you're causing chronic depletion of magnesium through your choices and behaviors, it's really going to slow down your capacity to recover. Now, magnesium deficiency can cause a whole lot of different kinds of symptoms as well. Uh, one of those symptoms is depression. Magnesium deficiency highly linked to depression. Magnesium deficiency highly linked to elevations in blood sugar and a thickness in your blood. So, like this, your blood has a natural viscosity, and, and we want that blood flow to be low viscosity, not high viscosity. A higher viscosity blood, it's like when your oil gets dirty in your engine in your car and your pistons have to work harder and they create more friction to, to generate mo you know the combustion engine to generate energy well if your blood viscosity is too thick what happens is your heart has to pump harder your blood vessels have to squeeze harder they all have to work harder which can actually lead to elevation in blood pressure so magnesium deficiency can actually cause high blood pressure through increasing platelet aggregation or increasing viscosity of your blood so think of it in terms of if you're on a blood pressure lowering medication that depletes magnesium, what that could actually do. It can actually feed back into recreating high blood pressure for a different reason. So again, it's one of those paradoxes of, of medicines that are sometimes used um, to mask your symptoms or to mitigate your symptoms without resolving your origin. So magnesium deficiency will thicken your blood, will make your platelets clump. Magnesium deficiency can cause depression. Magnesium deficiency will cause muscle spasm. Magnesium deficiency will cause constriction of your blood vessels, leading to increased uh, blood pressure. Magnesium deficiency will lead to um, a reduction in your capacity to make happy hormones like dopamine. So those are some of the, the, the general functions of magnesium. Where do we get magnesium? So in essence, um, if, if we want to incorporate more magnesium into our diet, one of the best places that you can do that is, is pick green food. So that would be kale or chard or broccoli or cabbage. Think of green. These are going to be foods that are rich in magnesium. Nuts are rich in magnesium. So you want to make sure you're getting ample quantity. Most people don't eat enough vegetables in their diet to adequately get the daily need for magnesium. This is one of the reasons why this is one of the top deficiencies uh, in the in all of industrial life. It's, it's one of the leading nutritional deficiencies. So remember, um, magnesium very, very critical for a lot of different functions. Magnesium deficiency is easy to come by because of our modern world. Uh, a lot of our processed foods don't have magnesium in them. There's no fortification of magnesium in the food. Uh, a lot of our processed foods displace magnesium because they either have high levels of caffeine and some of them actually have high levels of sodium, which make it harder to absorb magnesium. So, again, depending on what your diet is like. Now, if your diet is super clean, then, then now what do we want to do? We want to make sure that you're getting your magnesium levels evaluated. Uh, there are a number of ways that this can be done. It can be evaluated in the serum. Uh, which is not the most accurate. So if your doctor is running just a general serum magnesium test, it's not real super accurate of your of your overall magnesium storage. Some people will run red blood cell magnesium levels, which is a which is a good marker. And my favorite marker, even better, is a lymphocyte marker. It's a, it's a it's an intracellular measurement of magnesium based on cell growth, and it's it's uh, probably the most effective way to get the whole body status of magnesium to give you an idea of whether or not you might be deficient. Because some, what happens to some people is they get on magnesium supplementation and, uh, and, it, and it's a good move. They feel better, they feel more relaxed, they don't feel as depressed, they have more energy, they lose weight. You know, magnesium can do a really a lot of great things for a lot of people. At, at uh, as low as 400 milligrams and, and upwards of 100 milligrams of magnesium a day, very, very safe generally to take. Now, what sometimes happens though if you don't need magnesium is it can actually make you more groggy lower your blood pressure and push your blood pressure too low. So, and don't just, my advice is not just randomly take it or if you aren't, randomly take it without testing it. Pay attention to that. If your blood pressure starts to drop, if you start to become lethargic and fatigued, you know that you probably are not deficient in magnesium. You probably don't need it. Um, some different forms of magnesium, probably one of the best forms is magnesium citrate, uh, but there's magnesium glycinate. What we're looking for are amino acid chelates or cyclokinase 
magnesium, what these do is, is they're absorbed more effectively and more efficiently. Now, some of you may be struggling, and this will go for the other nutrients that I talked about today. This will go for those as well. If you struggle with um, chronic gastrointestinal problems or if, you've been, if your gut has been diseased or you've been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, realize that most of the magnesium when you eat it is absorbed in the distal small intestine and the proximal colon. So right where your small intestine and your colon meet, that's where a lot of your magnesium is absorbed. It's also the area where inflammation, damage, and scar tissue can occur in patients with celiac disease or in people with gluten sensitivity. So keep that in mind. You might be taking magnesium and you, you know you get it tested and it's still low. It could be that, that the area of your intestine that absorbs it has been scarred. And so you're going to potentially need more daily magnesium to meet your intake needs than the average person might need. This is something that we commonly see happen. Now, now, on another note, there's another, um, I'm going to put this up here on the board for you. There's a mutation in a gene called COMT. So COMT, so if you've had like a 23andMe test done where they measured your COMT gene, that stands for catecholomethyltransferase. This particular gene drives your body's natural ability to uh, metabolize estrogen. So for those, especially the females that have a history of, of cancer, breast cancer or uterine cancer, this particular enzyme, this particular gene responsible for helping you metabolize your estrogen, this is a magnesium-driven gene. So if you don't have adequate magnesium, you'll have problems with estrogen metabolism. So it can actually lead to hormonal disruption, increased risk for cancers, and increased risk for hormone abnormalities. And I've seen cases where women they're, they develop PMDD, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, or premenstrual symptoms. And, and generally, these types of symptoms for those women are depression and cramping and fatigue. So if you around your cycle are getting depressed, having a, a cramping issue and having a lot of fatigue, it's very possible you have a COMT mutation that requires your body to need more magnesium. So it's sometimes a good idea during during pre-cycle time maybe to bolster your magnesium levels. Okay, let's see here. We could go on a long about magnesium because it's just such a profound profound nutrient. Okay, I want to uh, pull that down. We can't go out there. We've got to share. Uh, we've got to share with the other nutrients. Now let's talk a little bit about zinc. Zinc is okay. So magnesium is one of the top deficiencies from a testing perspective. When I run lab tests on patients, and we've tested over five thousand people in the last sixteen years. Uh, zinc is the second most common deficiency that I see in the clinic. And zinc is critical for over 200 chemical responses. Next to magnesium, we know more about zinc than any other nutrient. In essence, magnesium has more functions than any nutrient that we know of, is number two. Um, so zinc deficiency can lead to a lot of different problems, including pain. Uh, and one of the reasons why is zinc is necessary for the formation of cartilage, it's necessary for the formation of the collagen, it makes your tendons, ligaments, and muscles. Zinc is also an immune regulator, so it helps your immune system mature, it helps the cells of your immune system properly mature. Zinc plays a role in the oxidant, it drives a system in your body called superoxide dismutase, or SOD, if you've, if you've not heard of SOD, superoxide dismutase is an antioxidant system. Again, that is zinc dependent. And without having adequate quantities of zinc, you can actually your antioxidant status can go low. And this can increase your risk for a number of different diseases, diseases of oxidative stress, like heart disease and bone loss. So definitely we don't want to see a zinc deficiency. Zinc deficiency is important for a lot of the formation of your structural proteins, not just collagens, uh, or rather not just the tendons, the ligaments, and the cartilage, but other collagen-based proteins as well, primarily your hair. And so a lot of people start to develop hair loss. There's several reasons why this happens. Number one, zinc is necessary for the protein production of your hair. Number two, zinc builds a protein called RBC, retinal binding protein. Retinal binding protein carries vitamin A through your body. So zinc is a vitamin A carrier. It's very essential to carry vitamin A and distribute vitamin A to your tissues. So if you don't have adequate zinc, you can actually become vitamin A deficient. 
So we'll see the hair loss with vitamin A deficiency as well, but zinc, remember zinc deficiency causes vitamin A deficiency, which can lead to uh, skin inflammation and hair loss. And one of the, one of the kind of telltale signs of, of a zinc-induced vitamin A deficiency is you start to lose your ability to see in the dark. So, so if you ever found yourself at one point in your life where you just find you kind of get around in the dark, but you found that maybe you thought as you were getting older, you could see at night as well. So like when you're driving on the road at night, maybe it's become harder for you to see. This is uh, one of the hallmark classic symptoms when you start to lose your night vision um, or your ability to discriminate at night, uh, night at night. Things deficient oftentimes at the root of that. One of the other things you can do is look at your fingernail. If you look at your fingernails and you've got like white spots on the tips of your fingernails or on the bases of your fingernails, not the little moon at the base of your fingernail, but just white spots. I did a video on this a few months ago. You can check it out at, uh, at youtube.com slash glutenology and just type in zinc deficiency, and I did a, a fingernail video on this very thing. But white spots on the fingernails can oftentimes be a signal or a symptom of a zinc deficiency. So keep that in mind as well. Just a simple way to look down and say, okay, I've got a bunch of white spots on my nail beds. Maybe maybe zinc is a supplement and I, I should consider in my home vitamin or maybe I should take supplemental zinc. Now, safe doses, 50 to 100 milligrams a day of zinc um, can be taken. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to take. One of the things that you do have to be aware of when you do take zinc is that it can cause nausea. So if you're, if you're taking any zinc at all, make sure that you're not taking it uh, on an empty stomach. Take it with food. So again, zinc you know, the biggest the biggest issue with zinc is that it can cause nausea. And uh, and if you're taking it on an empty stomach, that nausea can make you feel really bad and like you want to throw up. So just make sure you're getting plenty of food. Don't eat it. Don't take zinc with just a small snack. Now, if you put up a link as well uh, on the zinc, the type of zinc that I recommend. Generally, you want to take, when you're taking zinc, uh, you don't want to just take zinc by itself. There's some cofactors that help zinc work. One of those cofactors is pure doxyl. Biphosphate, also known as vitamin B6, one of the other cofactors that, that helps to zinc to work is magnesium. So, again, going back to magnesium, which we talked about a minute ago. So, B6 and magnesium help zinc work. So, if you're taking just a, just a zinc product without those two things, it might not be as effective. So keep that in mind as you're looking for a zinc problem or a product. Now, loose bowel is one of the other symptoms of a zinc deficiency, and this is because zinc is very, very critical. Uh, at helping your immune system build antibodies in your GI tract. One of those antibodies is called SIGA, secretory IgA, also known as uh, secretory immunoglobulin A. I just kind of put that up there on the, on the board for you. So SIGA is, you need zinc to make it. And if you don't have adequate SIGA production in your GI tract, we all make it. We make it in our saliva, we make it in our GI tract, and its job is to bind on to bacteria and viruses and other genetic microorganisms that can cause disease so that those things don't get access through a leaky gut into our blood uh, into our bloodstream and so so zinc deficiency when you're not binding those things your body's next natural response is to have loose bowels or create diarrhea as a result of that zinc deficiency so keep that in mind as well if you struggle from chronic loose bowels you've got white spots on your fingernails you're getting sick every other week you're probably a pretty good candidate for the suspicion of a zinc deficiency as far as foods are concerned, where do we get zinc? Um, most of it is meat. So, look, many of you might be a uh, vegetarian, and if you are, you're going to have to understand that a vegetarian diet is lower in zinc. You, most of the zinc in the human diet is going to come from animal-based foods. So, that doesn't mean you know that doesn't mean you can't be a vegetarian. This, we're not going to have that conversation today in this video. Um, it just simply means that's the truth. You've got to have uh, adequate animal product in your diet to get adequate levels of zinc. Remember, there are times where we need more zinc, and in those times, like in children, for example, uh, when children are growing, the, um, the the growth for children is very, very important. You're going to see on children's fingernails, you'll see a lot of white spots. That's normal for kids. If they're under 18, that's a pretty normal thing. It doesn't necessarily mean they're zinc deficient. But they are burning through more zinc storage because they're they're basically supporting a lot of growth rate. So keep that in mind. Zinc is found in meat. It's found in 
foods like oysters is a really actually a really good food for for zinc, but I don't recommend eating a lot of oyster. Uh, but, but regular meat, red meat, chicken, fish, you know, beef, venison. These are all really solid ways to get zinc in the diet. You can get zinc in vegetables as well, but many of the vegetables contain phytates and oxalic acid, which bind to zinc and, and make it harder for your body to absorb zinc from vegetables. So vegetables aren't the best way to get zinc. Uh, animal tissue is. So just keep that in mind. Now, if you suspect that you have a zinc deficiency, maybe you are a vegetarian, you know, go to your doctor and ask them to measure your zinc. The best way to measure zinc is through uh, looking at lymphocyte proliferative cell response. So you're looking at lymphocytes, which is the type of white blood cell, and measuring the quantity of zinc stored within those white blood cells. It's the most accurate way to represent or to get a zinc uh, uh, a zinc level back. If you're running serum zinc markers, they're going to be based on your last meal and they're not real super accurate, so don't recommend looking at it that way as solely. Okay. Let's talk about vitamin B12 next. And I'll put up another picture for you. Um, vitamin B12 deficiency, this actually, in my experience, is the number one deficiency I see in the clinic. It's absolutely the most common deficiency hands down of, of, of all uh, deficiencies that I do see, um, this is it, this is number one. Now, vitamin B12 has a lot of different functions, and um, and one of the, let me back up just a minute, one of the reasons why vitamin B12 is so common, so common in my clinic, it has to do with the fact that B12 is necessary, um, or rather B12 is absorbed in the junction the same junction, similar magnesium absorbed in the junction of the GI tract that gets damaged the most by gluten. And again, that's my practice is, is largely gluten centric and focused. So people come and you see me, highly gluten sensitive individuals with this damage to the GI tract, where they have this great propensity toward B12 deficiency. Now, other people that have B12 deficiency, it's super common to see people that have had gastric bypass or people that are taking Nexium or Rolly. Toms or other antacids that suppress stomach acid production because B12 requires acid to be absorbed. So um, there are other people that have gluten issues and don't know if they're eating gluten. And, and the type of damage that gluten is causing, it doesn't just have to damage the small intestine. So a lot of people think, oh, um, you know, I don't need to worry about gluten because I don't have celiac disease. But realize that one of the things that we've seen gluten contribute to and cause is it's damage to the stomach lining, particularly damage to the cells in the stomach called parietal cells, and these cells are responsible for producing the acid and it's called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor, so intrinsic factor, why is it so important? Intrinsic factor is what binds to vitamin B12 in the stomach and helps to shuttle it across the intestines to be absorbed. So if you've got a gluten issue where your parietal cells are being damaged and you're not producing adequate quantities of intrinsic factor, you can actually cause a vitamin B12 deficiency even if you're getting enough B12 in your diet. Now like zinc, B12 is prominently found, I mean bioavailable B12 is predominantly found in uh, in animal foods, not in vegetables, and, and many, many people try to get it from blue algae or, or from yeast-based sources. These are still not great sources of vitamin B12. It's very, very hard to get adequate B12 um, from plant-based, from any kind of plant-based food. And, and really, if you're a vegetarian, again, not to pick on vegetarian at all, but if you're a vegetarian and you're committed to that diet, then you've got to really, this is one of those nutrients you really want to have. have your doctor test regular to see that you are or not deficient in it so that you can um, so that you can accommodate that with supplementation if necessary. Um, so again, low stomach acid can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Taking medicines that block stomach acid can cause B12 deficiency. Uh, food allergy where you've got damage to the part of the intestine that absorbs the B12 can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, chemotherapeutic agents, if you've gone through cancer treatment or if you know somebody going through cancer treatment, those types of things, they can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. 
damage to the liver. So if you're on a medication that, that or multiple medications that have to be processed through the CYP or the cytochrome P450 system in the liver, this can actually contribute to a vitamin B12 deficiency as well. One of the things about B12 deficiency, we talk about the symptoms, the biggest symptom that I see is a person who sleeps eight plus hours, they get adequate sleep, but they wake up like like they've been run over by a Mack truck. They're super tired despite the fact that they slept adequately. That's a hallmark of anemia. And B12 deficiency causes a type of anemia. It's not the same type of anemia as an iron deficiency anemia. This type of anemia is called a macrocytic anemia. You need vitamin B12 for your red blood cells to grow, to mature. And if you don't have adequate B12, your red blood cells don't mature uh, to the level where they're capable of carrying oxygen efficiently. And so that form of anemia is actually quite prevalent. You see it on a very, very common basis. So B12 deficiency, is, or B12 rather, is needed to form red blood cells. It's also needed to form white blood cells. So some people have white blood cell anemia, like your lymphocytes or your fills or your basophils uh, or your eosinophils or your monocytes. Those are the five different types of white blood cells can be low. We can also see platelets being low. So if you've ever gone to the doctor and you consistently have low white blood cells or low red blood cells or low platelets, that's a potential possibility. You might have vitamin B12 deficiency that hasn't been discovered yet. One of the other things I want to mention about B12 is, is that B12 deficiency causes an elevation in a chemical called homocysteine. Now, we all make homocysteine. Homocysteine is a natural byproduct of human metabolism. In essence, you make it, I make it, everyone makes it. But homocysteine has, we have an exhaust pipe for it, meaning we, we get rid of it and we recycle it. Generally, what happens with homocysteine is we recycle it either to methionine, which is a, an essential amino acid for growth and for DNA and for, and for fat and, and protein metabolism, or we, we take uh, homocysteine downstream and we can create or help to create things like glutathione, which is a master antioxidant of the body, or we can help use homocysteine to help the liver uh, bile salt and detoxify. So homocysteine gets used in different ways, but if we don't have adequate B12, it, it can't it can't be properly recycled through these methylation cycles. And so what happens is it builds up. Too much homocysteine becomes a problem because it can damage blood vessels, it can damage brain cells, it can damage nerve cells, it can damage uh, bone tissue. So what is homocysteine elevation linked to? It's been linked to heart disease, it's been linked to cancer, it's been linked to risk of stroke, it's been linked to diabetes, it's been linked to trauma. So if you struggle with any problems, you know, a good thing to have your doctor measure, and most doctors understand or know you, measure is homocysteine. And so it's simple to measure what you're looking for um, in measuring homocysteine is you want your level to ideally be under nine. So if you're if you're riding higher than nine, there's a very good possibility that you don't have enough B12. Also folate plays a role in homocysteine metabolism, also B6 and vitamin B2 play a role in that. So have your doctor check those other nutrients as well because B, although B12 deficiency can cause elevation in homocysteine, it's not the only thing that can cause that. So it's good to, to look at all of those different things to make sure that, um, that that's not happening. Now, one of the last things that I want to talk about with B12 deficiency is that understand that B12 is necessary to body liver particularly to produce choline. Now, choline is a very, very critical uh, bionutrient. Choline helps the liver to process fat. So what happens when you don't have B12 and, and subsequently don't have choline is the liver will start to take on more fat, storing more fat. Now, again, that's oftentimes what we refer to as fatty liver disease, right? Now, if you're not a drinker and you've had that that test to come back and ultrasound the liver and selling fat, great. Um, it's very possible if you're not a drinker that you could have a vitamin B12 deficiency that's contributing to that fatty infiltration of the liver. Um, the other thing B12 is important for it, you need B12 to form many of the different neurotransmitters, adrenaline, acetylcholine is one of the main ones. Remember, choline is it's like a B vitamin, and actually it should be classified as a B vitamin, but it was discovered after the other B vitamins, so it generally doesn't be classified that way. Um, but choline, when you don't have adequate choline, from a, again, from a B12 deficiency, then you can't produce acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter that your brain cells use to communicate to the rest of your body. 
So for example, when, when your brain is sending a message to your spinal cord and that message from your spinal cord goes to your gut, and it's telling your gut about digestion or it's telling your adrenal glands about producing uh, different hormones or it's telling your muscles to move. Those, those messages are delivered through acetylcholine. And if you don't have adequate B12 and that inhibits your choline capacity, then you can't make acetylcholine and that can lead to depression. Now, you, most people think about depression. What do they think about? They think about poor me, I'm so sad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about depressed neurological function. So yes, it can, it can lead to symptoms of poor me, I'm so sad, but it can also lead to uh, reduced capacity to work out, meaning exercise intolerance. Your muscles are not receiving the neurological message from your brain and spinal cord about proper, uh, about, about proper contraction because there's not enough acetylcholine to deliver that message consistently. That can lead to premature fatigue. So, so depressed muscle function is common. Depressed organ function, again, your organs work under the control of acetylcholine. So it's depressed function, not just necessarily depression. So all those things being said, vitamin B12, again, in my experience, is the top deficiency that I see. Some forms of vitamin B12 that you might, you might want to take note of. One is methyl cobalamin. That form is, is a, one of the best and most bioavailable forms of vitamin B12. Now, some of you with uh, methylation problems don't do as well with methylcobalamin, and so hydroxycobalamin might be a better option for you. Uh, just FYI, so those are, those are probably two of the best forms, and the form that you probably don't want, in essence, the form I, I recommend not to use is a form of B12 called cyanocobalamin. This one is not quite as bioavailable to humans, and uh, and and so if you're looking, you know, as you're looking for good, at different supplements, not a post white the one I recommend to you is called methylcobalamin. I just put that into the feed for you. Um, that's one I would recommend that you that you look at if you're trying to get a B12 deficiency corrected because. Uh, remember, if you've got stomach damage, if you're on antacids, if you've got pre-existing scar tissue in your GI tract where vitamin B12 is absorbed, all those things can be inhibiting factors and how well your body is going to take in B12. And so the, one of the better ways to take it in is through a sublingual where you it's a lozenge that you suck on and it is absorbed through your cheeks. Therefore, it's bypassing your GI tract and going into your bloodstream through your cheeks. It's one of the best ways to do it. Now, some people have sprays that they use and some do injections of B12 and those, you know, with sprays, one of the things you have to watch out for is an ingredient called sodium benzoate or sodium or benzoic acid. Um, this is a this is a preservative and it's not a healthy preservative. So if, you, if you're using a product that has that agent in it, it's not something I recommend. Uh, as far as the injections are concerned, some of the injections that don't, uh, you know, I, I I don't in my experience the injections working better than B12 as long as oral is, is of the sublingual variety. So injections are not necessarily more effective. And remember, when I say injections, I don't mean IVs. I mean muscular injections. Some people get muscular injections of B12 on a monthly basis. I'd much prefer to put a person on a, I'd much prefer to put a person on a oral lozenge than have them go and get an injection once a month. Uh, because one, an injection increases the, you know, I mean, it, it's not super dangerous, but I mean, every time you stick a needle in your skin, you run the risk of, you know, when you pierce your skin, you run a risk. There's a risk involved with that. There's not really a risk in taking an oral supplement. So dosing wise, uh, a good place to start for vitamin B12 is between two and 10,000 grams a day, severely, severely. Again, that's not a main dose. If you're not, if that's just if you have a severe deficiency, you're really trying to get it corrected anywhere between two and 10,000 micrograms a day, depending on the individual. Okay. Next nutrient and last nutrient we're going to talk about today is, let's plug that up there. We're going to talk about vitamin D. This is super common. Vitamin D. Uh, I like to I really like to think about vitamin D. As, as universal human duct tape. It has so many different functions um, that are helpful um, in, in, um, in putting the body in a strong position. What I, what I mean by that is functions of vitamin C, one of the biggest functions of vitamin C has to do with the 
feeding of the adrenal glands. Many people with chronic illness have a major, major issue uh, with adrenal gland function. And, uh, and, and one of the problems there is that, that chronic stress and chronic inflammation are basically our sponges for vitamin C. So they, they basically burn through the vitamin C. Your adrenal gland is like an, a vitamin C sponge. It, it uses large quantities of vitamin C to help your body produce cortisol, which is an anti-inflammatory hormone. So the more inflammation that you have, the more uh, of a problem that can turn into be, uh, especially especially uh, if you've got chronic inflammation. So it will it basically will start body's resource of vitamin C that will put you in a state of vitamin C deficiency. And once that happens, let's just think about the functions of vitamin C. One of vitamin C's function is in what's called a redox. It, it helps to reduce glutathione. And, and uh, what that means is it helps to recharge the liver's primary ability to help your body detox. That's why when we talk about vitamin C, it's helpful for liver detoxification. One of the other functions that are revolving around the liver for vitamin C is that vitamin C is necessary to form bile. You remember your liver produces bile, bile is a binder, it binds on the toxins in the intestine and prevents them from coming into your body. But bile is also important for fat absorption. So you need bile for vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, and omega-3 fatty acid absorption. Uh, one of the other functions of vitamin C is it's a very, very strong free radical scavenger. So it works to help protect cells from damage, helps protect DNA from damage. You've heard of a telomere before, telomeres are the end caps to your DNA. And, and the more damage your telomeres take on, the faster you age. So if we can preserve the length of your telomeres of your DNA, then you can do that with vitamin C. It's going to promote longevity. It's going to promote a longer, higher quality of life. We're going to see vitamin C is necessary for nitric oxide formation. Now, this is a substance that your, um, that your blood vessels need to make for vasodilation. So help blood vessels dilate and, uh, and, and, and not help your blood vessels are really restricted and how to have time dilating and vitamin C deficiency is going to lead to a reduction in that chemical and make your blood pressure actually cause your blood pressure to go up and it makes your blood vessels much more restrictive and more prone to inflammatory damage. Vitamin C is necessary to form more collagen crosslink. Now collagen crosslinks, if you've ever seen a ladder, you've got two big bars and then the rings that go through the middle and you kind of step on the rings, right? Well, the, the, the backbone of the ladder are the, are, are the two parallel bars, but what holds the ladder together and allows you to ascend it are these rings. Your collagen looks a lot like a ladder, only twisted, and only it has instead of only having two parallel uh, parallel pieces, it has that third parallel piece. So think of your think of your collagen on microscopically. Think of your collagen as a triple helix, meaning you've got three rungs, and in between those rungs, you've got crosslinks like the steps of a ladder. Those crosslinks are made out of vitamin C, and if you don't have adequate vitamin C, what happens? Is Tendons in your ligaments become more fragile. Your hair becomes more fragile because your hair is made out of uh, the tripeptide collagen. So you've got you've got you've got vitamin C necessary to form the rings in between your collagen, which is what makes your collagen elastic and tensile and strong. So if you don't have adequate vitamin C again, that can lead to structural damage. That's why if you've heard of scurvy, scurvy is the name of the disease state. It's it's like the worst vitamin C deficiency imaginable. It's when your teeth are falling out. It's when your gums are bleeding so massively, your teeth are falling out. You actually go crazy um, because you need vitamin C to produce dopamine and serotonin so it can affect your neurotransmitter production. Um, but here's one other thing. If you, if you, those of you who are, are Kevin Costner fans never saw the movie uh, Waterworld, there was a, a scene in that movie where uh, they, he was on the boat, and they sailed up next to another guy on the boat, and that guy was a little bit crazy and batty. He actually had scurvy, it's be, and then so they were. He was trying to steal the lime tree from him because again, lime is a is a source of vitamin C. This was actually discovered because of sailors. And if you've ever heard the term limey, limey refers to British sailors, and it refers to the fact that British sailors. And there was an admiral that discovered that when he packed limes on the boats and his and his uh, sailors had the ascorbate, they didn't develop the scurvy problems when they were sailing across the Atlantic. So, so that's, a, that's kind of a history behind how he was discovered and, and how we discovered what scurvy actually was. But scurvy is an, is an end case, worst case scenario for vitamin C deficiency. Long before scurvy sets in, a person's going to be uh, losing 
air, a person's going to have easy bruising, a person's going to have chronic inflammation and chronic swelling in their joints, they might have blood pressure problems. So these are the things that happen first. And then one of the last functions of vitamin C is that it helps to bind heavy metals. So metals like mercury and cadmium, you, vitamin C, understand that one of its functions or capacities is it, is it, is it, it works on since like a chelating agent. So a very, very effective nutrient for, for many different functions. Now vitamin C, uh, we're going to get most of our vitamin C from produce. So fruits, vegetables that are vivid in color, so reds, oranges, yellows, um, blues, purples, things that have very vivid colors tend to have more vitamin C. There's a theory that humans actually developed our color vision uh, because we lost our capacity to synthesize our own vitamin C and we had to find vitamins from food. And so um, we're one of the few mammals that cannot produce uh, our own vitamin C. And so understand that, that um, you know, the best place to get it is going to be from produce, you know, whether it be vegetables or fruits can be rich in vitamin C. You look for very, very bright colors and they can only tell you that there's going to be some type of uh, nice vitamin C within that. Now, um, what I recommend in, in vitamin C, because part of the problem with vitamin C is that you, you when you when manufacture vitamin C, we're talking about supplemental vitamin C. One of the things that happens when manufacturers produce vitamin C is is it oxidizes. By the time you're getting it, it's actually already been oxidized. It's no longer effective or helpful. Um, and you don't want to get a hold of a vitamin C of that nature because uh, it can actually do damage instead of good. I just put up a, a type of vitamin C in the in feed for you. But this type of vitamin C, one, one, one of the things you want to look for with a vitamin C product is one that's not made out of GMO modified corn, which many of them are. About 90% of the vitamin Cs in the U.S. are GMO corn-based products. And you don't want to have anything to do with that. Number one, the pesticide exposure. Number two, uh, if you're food sensitive or grain sensitive, you want to be able to avoid any kind of derivative of, of a grain. Um, but the other thing is that when you're when nit when you're when you're forming vitamin C, you want to you want to do so under what's called a nitrogen blanket. Now, um, for those of you who don't know what that is, probably most of you don't. A nit it's, it's nitrogen is a gas that helps to preserve the integrity and reduce the oxidation of the vitamin C when it's being produced. And so, making it underneath a nitrogen blanket allows for the preservation of of the quality of the vitamin C as opposed to not. So. Um, very, very important when you're looking at vitamin C to get a very high quality brand and don't, again, don't don't just jump for any brand. It's, there's some brands that sell like the local stores, the local stores like the gas station, you know, little packet, green cake, um, mix it in water. Those I don't recommend because most of them are probably going to be oxidized. Most of them probably have artificial flavors and colors. Most of them probably have some type of GMO corn. Uh, as the base, and so it's just not something I recommend that you do if you're trying to do something to improve your health. Uh, doses for vitamin C range, I mean, all the way from as little as a couple of hundred milligrams all the way up to 10 plus grams in a day, depending on the person, depending on how sick they are, and depending on need. Um, some doctors will use IV 